Hello, this is Dr. Rosario Tripoletti. I'm located in Ramsey, New Jersey, and I run the Pandas Pans Institute, which is the only institute in the world exclusively devoted to the study of pandas. I've been running this institute uh, continuously since 2009 and uh, had an interest in pandas since 1998. And over the years, I've seen more than 5,000 patients with this disease, which I believe is the largest experience anywhere in the world with this disease. I've been devoted to understanding both the, uh, the clinical care of these patients and also understanding uh, the underlying science. Historically, Pandas was described in the mid to late 1990s by Dr. Susan Suedo and her colleagues. Um, and they, had, they noted there were a subgroup of children that seemed to have the acute onset of symptoms of OCD and or motor tics in association with streptococcal and other infections. They wrote a paper in 1998 describing 50 cases of what they called PANDAS. And the acronym, so an acronym means uh, lots of big letters that stand for lots of other stuff. It's a lot of that in medicine. So COVID, you know, is an, or, uh, is an, uh, is an acronym, uh, coronavirus uh, in, in, uh, in, in infectious disease. So you, COVID is really an acronym, but PANDAS stands for Pediatric Autoimmune Neuropsychiatric Disorder Associated with Streptococcus. You know, the, looking back now, 20, 25 years, it is pediatric. It happens mostly in children. It's not necessarily autoimmune, as at least early on, although there are, there are autoimmune aspects to pandas. Uh, the symptoms are predominantly neuropsychiatric. That's, uh, that's accurate. And, uh, but its association with streptococcus is not one-to-one. -one. So uh, because this was a good first attempt, this uh, made a, a big splash, but doctors soon became very skeptical of it because they saw the, the problems with this type of definition. So it got changed in 2013 at a conference at, the, Neuro, uh, at uh, the National Institutes of Mental Health that was replaced by the term pediatric acute neuropsychiatric syndrome. The presentation of pandas is interesting because it can look differently in different age groups. The most common presentation that you hear about most on the internet is the one that appears usually between a child from six to 12. And the characteristic of pandas, um, uh, which is, you know, it's nice to have it, but it's not absolutely necessary, is a very abrupt onset of symptoms. So the textbook case would be a pretty normal six to seven, maybe eight year old child girl or a boy who one day uh, uh, wakes up uh, or uh, suddenly turns into a complete personality change with the development of OCD, some mixture of these, I would say, OCD separation anxiety, tics, language regression, or urinary issues. The full list is online, but these are the main symptoms that we see. And now, uh, one thing to know is it doesn't have to be acute onset. So if your child has had symptoms that a change, but it's not a change that you can point to a specific day or time, please consider this uh, uh, to be evaluated. Now, the other thing, which is a little bit less widely, widely known on the internet, and there's lots of information on the internet about, uh, about uh, pandas and pans, both in uh, NIH websites and uh, as well as uh, social media, such as Facebook. Uh, the syndrome that's most known is the uh, sudden onset of OCD, separation, anxiety, and tics. And this is really the only one that the NI NIH endorses as the classic uh, presentation. However, I can tell you from experience, when PANS presents uh, in the infantile period, under age three, it can be indistinguishable from autism. So in my opinion, the uh, acute onset of autistic symptoms, which often happens. Uh, many people uh, report a sudden change in a child, uh, sometimes following an infection or a vaccine. Uh, PANS should be considered in that patient. In a little older child, it can look like severe ADHD. 
sudden onset of hyperactivity. And I use the word manic hyperactivity because it's really another level uh, above OCD. This tends to be um, uh, kindergarten or pre-K children, often boys more than girls in this age group, if it can happen in either gender. Um, then there's an adolescent phase, which uh, Dr. Kovacevic, a, a physician in the Chicago area, first described on his website, where there's pure OCD without any other symptoms. And uh, that can happen suddenly in an adolescent that has had no prior history of this. We had uh, in 19, uh, I'm sorry, in 2012, uh, we described a uh, group of children in the uh, Rochester, New, New, New York area in a town called Leroy that I call the Leroy syndrome who had this sudden onset of ticks in, in a group. And uh, I was uh, able to establish that in fact it was uh, pandas pants. Um, so it can have different presentations in different age groups. The, uh, the one thing that's a good rule is if you see a, a sudden change in behavior, your child just doesn't feel right to you. You have a gut feeling that something has changed abruptly. Definitely consider this in the differential diagnosis. Could it be other things? Absolutely. For example, there could be something like some sort of uh, a, a child abuse or child molestation going on where there's a change in behavior of a child. But very frequently that's rapidly excluded from the picture and one, uh, one needs to consider the PANS diagnosis. So among the PANS triggers, there are many things known. One is the streptococcus, which is associated with strep throat, which is called streptococcus pyogenes. And in fact, that was the one that was most commonly associated with PANS. In my opinion, there's a second strep called streptococcus pneumoniae that is even more important than the group-based strep. And we find that infection in many patients with acute or chronic PANS. Another very important trigger that's recognized is mycoplasma pneumoniae, which is the main cause of walking pneumonia. The various agents that cause Lyme disease and Lyme co-infections such as Borrelia, which causes Lyme disease, Bartonella, cat scratch fever, and uh, Ehrlichia and anaplasma, as well as Babesia, can cause Lyme. Coxsackie B virus is a very common cause of PANS. I would say the top four would be group A, strep, pneumococcus, mycoplasma, and Coxsackie B. HHV6 can also cause, which is a, a virus not as well known that causes uh, roseola type of infection can cause it. Epstein-Barr virus, uh, which causes infectious mononucleosis can do it. But, and rarer, a bunch of other infections, including very unusual infections. We have a case associated with Zika virus, for example, and a case associated with chikungunya virus. When this slide was made, we didn't know about COVID, but rarely, not very prominently, COVID infections can produce uh, PANS flares as well. A variety of vaccines have been temporally associated with PANS. And of course, we want to be very careful with vaccine associated illnesses, but there's a suspicion both uh, from biological mechanism that some vaccines might be related. Allergies, especially if severe, whether or not IgE mediated, whether or not anaphylactic type allergies can also be associated. A pretty good rule of thumb is if, if an agent can give you fever, it can trigger PANS. So uh, PANS obviously doesn't happen in everybody. Otherwise we would see that uh, because almost all children at some point in their life get fever. So it must happen to a certain subpopulation of children. We think maybe one to 2% of neurotypical kids and perhaps up to 30% of children with autism. It seems to be more common there, although it hasn't been formally studied. Uh, so that we believe therefore that there's something a little different about the immune system in children with PANS that makes them have this funny reaction, which I call the alternative fever response, uh, rather than getting a fever or the usual typical symptoms of these infections, they get a psychiatric change. There have been genes associated with PANS. Um, one thing our laboratory or our institute, one thing our institute has focused on is a extensive gene-wide associated study of PANS. What that means is that we have done detailed whole exome sequencing, dense sequencing of genetic changes in 
approximately 400 patients with PANS and approximately 300 controls. By comparing the, the two populations, we can find out what genes or what changes in genes are enriched in the PANS population. They're only seen in PANS patients that are otherwise unrelated and not so much in controls. And the relative, you usually don't get 100% in one or the other, but you get something like what's called an enhancement or an increase in risk of having a particular gene. It's a little bit too complicated to explain how we got there, but let me show you some preliminary results that we have. Recently, we completed a gene-wide association study, and one of the main findings of such a study, which has just been submitted for publication, is that there is a very strong PANS gene, which goes by the name MTCH2, which I call MITCH2. Um, uh, variations in this gene in specific parts of this molecule lead to a substantial increase in risk of having PANS. If you have one error in the molecule, it increases your risk approximately threefold. Two errors in the molecule increase it five to sixfold, and three errors in the molecule increase it up to tenfold. So that you can. Uh, now, I mentioned that PANS is one to 2% of the population. So even having three errors in, the, in this molecule doesn't guarantee you're gonna have PANS, but it greatly increases the risk. And so if you're suspecting that a patient has PANS, this can be used as a very strong supportive diagnostic study. From other scientific studies, this region of the molecule corresponds precisely to that part of the molecule that interacts with a strongly binding protein called BID. It turns out that the MITCH2 BID interaction is a key interaction which regulates a process of what's called programmed cell death in cells. Programmed cell death is extremely important so this is a paper from uh, showing that the precise region of this MITCH2 molecule is the area where uh, BID binds. This is the first gene we found for PANS called MITCH2. And notice it affects the mitochondria. That suggests to us immediately that anything we can do to improve mitochondrial function will improve the immune system in this type of uh, problem with PANS. Default treatment for PANS does include a very powerful broad spectrum uh, mitochondrial uh, uh, function booster, such as NeuroNeeds. Uh, I like NeuroNeeds as uh, uh, for most children because it comes in powder form. It includes pretty much every vitamin you can think of. It's very comprehensive and includes many mitochondrial factors. So without knowing too much more about the details, that can help us. But this allows us to provide a special and uh, scientifically reasoned treatment for PANS uh, in, in these cases. So we advocate genetic testing in most patients with PANS um, because it lets us now for the first time look at a very, in a very deep way as to what's wrong. And for us to come up with strategies that are tailored to the individual patient and also involve, often involve um, naturopathic treatments uh, for these patients. Interestingly, uh, we have studied, besides doing genetic testing on patients, we do extensive laboratory studies on patients. That's something that's very unique to our practice. Uh, we include now routinely uh, tests of vitamins because I'm recognizing that nutritional deficiencies are common, maybe not just in PANS, but in young children in general. They're not the best eaters. Uh, so. Uh, we need to look carefully at those nutritional factors. This is also an area of interest of mine in the past, and I did author a, a chapter on vitamins and nutrition in the major textbook of pediatric neurology um, um, in the mid 90s. I wrote a, a review article of that in neurology. So it's an area of interest of mine for a long time is metabolic disease and vitamins as well. So, um, so we measure vitamins extensively in this patient and very frequently we'll find problems in B12 and folate metabolism in these patients. 
which uh, again points towards needs for uh, mitochondrial uh, boosters, various amino acids that are some of which are contained within the neuro needs. Um, so nutritional deficiencies are very common in these children, uh, sometimes because they have um, OCD behavior that uh, with restrictive eating. So they'll eat three things and those three things. So our best bet in a situation like that is to supplement them with the vitamins they need for their metabolism to be working properly. So that's why I advocate the use of uh, of vitamins, uh, it, uh, especially neuro needs because of its palatability to children and its, uh, its broad, um, you know, its broad uh, spectrum of compounds that it contains. Uh. Patients with autism seem to have a much higher incidence of, of pandas pan symptoms. Um, I, as I mentioned previously, it, it could be that pans uh, mimics autism in the very young child. So there might be an association there. But a further association happens when a nonverbal autistic child occur, uh, experiences a sudden change in behavior, where they, be, they go from um, quiet children to very suddenly aggressive and um, violent children. It, that has impact on their family life, on schooling, et cetera and uh, is, is a very difficult problem for the parents. Most parents say that's much harder problem than the autism itself to deal with. Um, so yes, uh, we uh, feel that all children that have autism probably ought to be evaluated for PANDAS early on. And any child with autism that has a marked behavioral change ought to also be evaluated. That part of the problem can often be treated quite easily by identifying the infectious trigger and treating the infectious trigger in that case, identifying the immune problem and treating the, auto, the uh, immune or autoimmune problem in that case. Uh, so uh, we also advocate in children with autism and in pan children with pandas in general, even more importantly in autism, uh, genetic testing um, as well, because then we can identify not only the pans component of it, but also the autism, uh, the cause of autism by our detailed genetic analysis. If you think your child may have PANS, call us or contact us. We're the only practice in the world exclusively devoted to the care of research of PANDAS PANS. Uh, we've been doing it for a long time now, since 1998. Uh, and over the years, we've seen 5,000 cases. We're located at in Ramsey, New Jersey, at the New York, New Jersey border in Suffern area. We um, offer easy access from New York, New Jersey, uh, Connecticut, and Pennsylvania. The Zoom or in-office consults are available, uh, and importantly, emergency consults as well. In my opinion, many children with, uh, with PANS, especially in crisis, uh, and PANS flares can be a crisis, need to be seen promptly. So I don't believe in two month, three month waits. We have emergency slots available and we can see you that very week, uh, sometimes that very day, um, and, or at most within uh, uh, the next uh, seven to 10 days. So we don't believe in long waits. We also see patients um, from all over the United States and are beginning to see older patients, children outside the pediatric as well. So. Uh, if you were a 30-year-old person and you think you might have PANS, please call us as well. Uh, the contact person is Mary Zandanella, Mary Z, and her phone number is 201-236-3876. I think we offer something very special here in, in, in the United States and the world, and, and please contact us for the best possible care of PANDAS PANS. In 2020.